So now we'll take the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma. We all sit in meditation as we're doing this. So we sit with our right foot placed upon our left thigh and our right hand on our left palm and establish our body in an upright posture. We keep our mindfulness to the four. And we do this in order to bring peace into our hearts. If we maintain our minds in a state of peace while listening to the Dhamma, then we have a good opportunity to understand it clearly. But if while we're hearing the Dhamma, we go off thinking about many things, then we'll gain very little from that. So with all of us sitting here listening to the Dhamma, it's just taken for granted that our bodies and our speech are already in a, a peaceful condition. And so we have sila, we have morality with us already. What's left is our minds. And these minds of ours like to go off and think, go and proliferate and create stories about things. They like to travel off into the past and the future, and they're doing this constantly. And when our minds are going off in this manner, they won't experience any inner calm or um, contentment. So Lumpu Cha would stress this practice constantly, that be they monks or lay people, it's important for everyone to have mindfulness in the present moment. And it's especially important while listening to the Dhamma. Because if we have presence of mind here, then we can contemplate into this truth that we're hearing. And it is possible to attain to the Dhamma through this. We're all aware that at the time of the Buddha, there were many, many people who um, gained the path and the fruits through this. When sitting, listening to the teachings of the Buddha, they would um, hear this truth that uh, he was expounding and would gain the eye of Dhamma through that. And many people attain to arahantship um, right there while listening. So it all depends on how um, intent we are in this act of listening. So Venerable Anya Kodanya, when he listened to the first sermon of the Buddha, he had great sincerity. The Stama Chakapavatana Sutta, the first discourse that the Buddha gave uh, in the Deer Park. And he understood that whatever is of the nature to arise is of the nature to cease. So he contemplated clearly and he saw that whatever is of the nature to arise, so that means anything, whatever forms of physicality there are, whatever mental things there are, um, things that have life and that which doesn't have life, everything. And that's what we mean when we say whatever is of the nature to arise. It means all things. So all of those things then will at some point cease. And that's their nature to be like that. So we understood this truth. But it's also natural for the beings that have been born into this world to have attachment and clinging to take things as being me and mine. The defilements in our hearts don't like to accept this truth. They don't like it that the things that we enjoy will have to cease one day. We just want more and more of them. The things that we like and give us pleasure, we want them to last forever. We don't want to become separated from them. We don't want to experience the decaying nature of conditioned phenomena. But when we see things in this way, then when uh, any form of physicality or mentality does undergo change, 
our hearts will suffer. And they suffer because we've gone and attached to them. We don't want them to be that way. So whenever there's a emotion that arises or anything external that uh, comes up that we enjoy and we like, then we don't want to experience separation from that. But it's natural that all of these things have to, um, we have to be parted from them. And when we do, then suffering will come up in our hearts. And so the mind that still has a lot of uh, kilesas, it um, has greed and it has uh, craving. We just want more and more of things. So if there's something we experience that we like, then um, there's bhava uh, dhanha there, that we want more of it, we want it to increase. And we don't want that thing to go away. We don't want it to disappear. And this is vibhava uh, dhanha. So we don't want to get old. We don't want to experience pain and sickness. We don't want to die. And we don't want any emotions or to be um, with anything that we find unpleasant. Such as feeling chaotic or feeling um, upset. And these are, this is all just the craving in our minds uh, operating. So whenever we find pleasure in the things of the world, then we become lost in those things. Whether it's a form or a sound, a taste, um, something that comes into contact with our body, a feeling of the body, or a thought or an emotion. If we enjoy that, then there's this bhava tanha there. We just want more and more of it. So when we have these sense organs in our body, when we have eyes and ears, a nose, tongue, body and mind, then it's natural that we'll experience uh, the sense objects that come in through those doors. So there are forms and there are sounds and uh, tastes, smells and touches. And there's also the thoughts and emotions that come into our hearts. And so our consciousness, our awareness uh, receives all of that. And if we don't have sufficient mindfulness and wisdom, then we'll go and cling on to that. And these three kinds of craving will come up uh, through the power of the helaces. They'll gain control over our minds. And we'll just become lost in these uh, sense impressions that we experience. And we won't want for them to change the things that we like. And the things that we don't like, we won't want to have any experience of, of them. So when Venerable Anya Kodanya contemplated into this truth, he was able to distinctly uh, see it for what it was. And he was able to accept as well that the nature of conditioned phenomena is just like this. And conditioned phenomena is anything that is physical or mental. All of it is of the nature to arise. And there's nothing special in that. When it comes up, then it's of the nature to cease as well. And so his mind knew this, and we call that uh, seeing clearly into the Dhamma. Anyone who sees the Dhamma then also perceives clearly the Buddha. Venerable Anya Kodanya had already uh, observed the Buddha, had already seen the Buddha, but this was just his physical form. He hadn't yet listened to the Buddha's teachings. But it was only when he heard the Dhamma that he was able to see the Buddha in his own heart. For all of us, when we begin the practice, we all start at the point of being uh, putujanas, uh, people who are thick with defilements and with uh, craving. But if we develop a consciousness of the dangers in these things, the dangers of greed, hatred, and delusion. 
and also seeing how these things affect our minds and how they can stir us up or the different causes or the different kinds of suffering and um, chaos that they bring into our lives. Then we'll be able to gain the energy to try and find a way out of these things. We'll see that anyone that's born into the world comes here because of delusion. And once born, then we increase this delusion. We take all things as um, in terms of self. And we don't think that these bodies of ours will have to die one day. We don't believe that one day we'll have to get old and one day we'll have to meet with pain and illness. We just want to get more and more from this world. We want more wealth and more possessions to gain things and heap things up. And if we don't have much wisdom, then we won't have any knowledge of how to give things away. And we don't even need to think about or speak about sila, morality. There just won't be any interest in that whatsoever. All we'll want is what we like, to gain more and more of it in any way we can. And we think that if we get more and more of what we like in this world, then that will give us lasting happiness. When we gain uh, praise, when we gain status, when we gain wealth and we gain pleasure, then we think that if we can just keep these things, then we'll be happy forever and we won't experience any pain or difficulties in our hearts. But the truth is that the world isn't like that. Forever, whenever we experience praise, then we're also going to have to meet with criticism. Whenever we gain, then at some point we'll have to meet with loss. Whenever we have an increase in our status or our fame, then we'll have to meet with disrepute. And along with pleasure also comes pain. So we can be overcome by delusion and not even think that our lives will have to meet with death. But if we do contemplate this, then we can see that when we do die, what can we take with us? Having been born into this world and taking a human form, one day we are going to have to meet with death. So we see that this world is really, it's just a world of supposition. And we suppose that there's a me and a them, and that these possessions are really ours. But these are just suppositions that we carry around. In the end, we have to throw all of our possessions away in this world, and that is us meeting with death. But if we contemplate this, we contemplate into the nature of our lives and their inevitable ending, then we'll be able to um, extract the delusion and the greed and the hatred there in our hearts. We'll be able to relieve these things from our minds. So we contemplate and we see that our lives do have to end in death. That death is sure and the end of life is death. Life is not certain, but death is certain. We can take this up as a meditation phrase that we um, keep reciting through our minds. and We can make it short or long as we wish. That life is not sure, but death is sure. Death is the end of our life. We have to meet with death. We recollect this frequently and keep our mindfulness there in this recollection of death. This will be able to stop any feelings of greed, hatred and delusion arising in our minds. And we'll be able to see the world as being an uncertain place and being uh, stressful and not self. See that the world and everything in it is not sure and unstable. 
this is close to wisdom. And we may think that this is true wisdom, but really it's just sanya. It's a memory that's come up. This recollecting death and that the world is not certain. Initially, it's just a memory. But we do gain a lot of benefits from that, from uh, keeping death as our kamatana object. And I practice like this myself a lot as well. So for all of us, we have um, faith, enough faith to come here and listen to the teachings. We have great faith in the Buddha and in his awakening. And so with that, we also have some form of understanding of the nature of sankara, of, uh, sankara the cycle of death and birth. And that our lives and our minds have been spinning around in this cycle for a very long time, taking birth and then dying over and over again. And sometimes we've been born into the animal world, been born as animals, sometimes as ghosts, and sometimes as uh, hell beings. And because we've been in this cycle of sangsara for an extremely long time, we've met with all of these things. And we've had to take countless births before we've had the opportunity to come into this human form and be interested in keeping precepts and listening to the Dhamma. We've been to hell many times and been a cowardly titan, been various kinds of animals many, many times. Even in a human form, we've met with countless uh, different states and different things. We've all been very wealthy people and we've all been uh, very poor. We've all been extremely famous before and we've all been people that no one really knows about. All of us have met with these different states. But because of this all is in the realm of uh, sankharas, of conditioned phenomena, every state that we've met with has had to decay and fade away. So the sangsara, the spinning around in the cycle of birth and death, we can't find an end to it. And the reason that we're still stuck here and the reason we've been going around and around is because uh, our minds are under the sway of the kilesas. They still have greed, hatred and delusion uh, firmly stuck there within. And these powers of greed, hatred, and delusion are what will cause our minds to spin on in this ocean of sang uh, sangsara forever. The Buddha said that the number of tears that we have shed because of pain and because of sorrow and grief and loss throughout our many uh, previous lives is greater than all the water in the oceans. And this is true. Of course it's true, because the number of lives that we've had before this, we just can't count that. We can, however, uh, estimate or measure the amount of water that's in the ocean. But our tears that we've shed in these countless previous lives, we can't begin to, to count or imagine how much that is. So it's a very long time that we've been stuck in this cycle that we've taken birth and had to meet with suffering. But now we've come into a human form and we've met with the teachings of the Buddha and this Buddhist religion. And we're very fortunate to have, to have done this. It's been a very long time that it's taken us to come to this point that we've been able to meet with the Dhamma of the Buddha and we've come to practice this Dhamma. Previously, our minds didn't have sila, morality, and they weren't interested in that. And this caused us to be full of uh, anguish and full of chaotic states. The amount of greed, hatred, and delusion there within our hearts was great. But now we've come to take the precepts and be interested in morality. Before, our minds didn't have any interest in sacrifice and in generosity. 
but now we are people who are devoted towards creating merits and being charitable. So Ajahn Chah would teach that seeing as we have a self and we have a body, we should take this body to create goodness and to abandon evil things. The things that we're attached to, we should try to gradually let go of that. The things that are dirty, we should try to make them clean. And whatever is dark, we should try to make it bright. We do this through developing skillfulness and through creating merit and goodness. So before we didn't have uh, much interest in generosity, but now we're very charitable people and we like to sacrifice. And why is that? Why should we develop this quality of sacrifice? Because if we just hoard things up and just gather possessions in this life, then we won't, we'll one day have to just throw them all away. When we die, we won't be able to take any of that with us. So having gained this external wealth, we then are generous with that and we learn how to give it away. This then uh, takes this physical wealth and makes it into a mental wealth, a form of like a possession that's there within our hearts. And this is a noble wealth and something that floods can't destroy. No one can come and steal it. The material things of this world and our um, physical possessions, um, it's not easy to destroy those. All it takes is some fire or a flood or a thief to come along and it's gone. And when this happens, we'll uh, be grieved over that loss. So when we take this external wealth and we're generous, we give it away, then it changes form into um, something mental, into uh, something that's there within our hearts and that can make our minds full and joyful. Then we experience the happiness of being someone who is kind and generous. And further on from this, we take our minds to become interested and involved in morality. So we take up the five precepts or the eight precepts. For the novices, there's the 10 precepts and the monks keep the 227 precepts. This is all in order to bring our bodies and our speech into a peaceful state. So when we have this, when we have sila, um, keeping our bodies and speech uh, peaceful and calm, what's left is our minds. Well, notice that even though we have sila, um, making our bodies calm, our minds yet don't experience much peace. So we have to then take up the practice of the Dhamma that the Buddha taught to train our minds uh, in line with the Buddha's teachings, to develop peace through uh, establishing mindfulness on one meditation object and keeping it there, to contemplate and to be developing our wisdom. Lumpur Cha would teach that anapanasati, the mindfulness over the breath as it comes in and leaves, is a very good object of meditation. When we sit in meditation, it's a good way of keeping our minds here in the present moment because they're fixed on the breath. We can also use the mantra of Buddha as well, along with this. And this will enable us to uh, keep our minds from thinking about external things. If they do go off, then we bring them back as quick as we can. It's the nature of our minds to go and extrapolate and proliferate because that's how they've been for a very long time. We haven't taken the effort to train them. 
But when we establish our mindfulness here in this present moment, um, then initially there won't be much peace. We can then, sorry, when there isn't much peace, then wisdom won't arise. Even though we contemplate, then we won't gain much clarity from that. We look or try to understand the nature of physicality, the nature of these bodies, the nature of our minds, but we won't be able to see very much. It'll be murky. And this is due to the defilements there that are insistent that um, these bodies, that our feelings, our memories, our thoughts, and sense consciousness, it's really me and it's mine. Really, this is all of the nature to arise, last, and cease. There's no self there. There's no me in any of that. But we've been deluded um, into thinking that it is me. But really, this nature of arising, lasting, and ceasing has been something that has been going on for a very, very long time already. It's just the, the delusion um, that's covering over our minds makes us go and attach to all of this, cling on. And this is what causes us to suffer. That suffering arises because of our attachments. So therefore, we must train our minds to be strong and stable, enough to be able to contemplate into the nature of the bodies so that we see clearly that they really are stressful, that they're constantly changing and there's not, they're not self. Clear seeing will then be able to arise and we'll be able to abandon the attachment that we have towards these things. Our hearts will know clearly the Dhamma. And just like Anya Kodanya saw the Dhamma, we'll see in that same way. For me, when I started the practice, it also wasn't easy. Bringing my mind to calm, it was a difficult thing to do, but I put in a lot of effort towards it. And it's necessary to really try to be persistent in the practice. Whatever unwholesome states had come up, I would put effort into abandoning them. And whatever wholesome states there were, then I would try to develop those and increase those. So we practice like this, training ourselves that um, whatever is unwholesome or unskillful, we try to not get involved with it and try to abandon it. And the skillful states, then we nurture those and develop those.